Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 13, entitled Dhritarashtra Quit Song, Text Number 16. Yudhishthiro labdharajyo drishtva pautram kulandharam bhratrabhir lokapala bhair mumude paraya shriya. Translation. Having won his kingdom and observed the birth of one grandson competent to continue the noble tradition of his family, Maharaj Yudhishthira reigned peacefully and enjoyed uncommon opulence in cooperation with his younger brothers who were all expert administrators to the common people. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Both Maharaj Yudhishthira and Arjuna were unhappy from the beginning of the battle of Kurukshetra. But even though they were unwilling to kill their own men in the fight, it had to be done as a matter of duty for it was planned by the supreme will of Lord Sri Krishna. After the battle, Maharaj Yudhishthira was unhappy over such mass killings. Practically, there was none to continue the Kuru dynasty after them, the Pandavas. The only remaining hope was the child in the womb of his daughter-in-law Uttara and he was also attacked by Ashwatthama. But by the grace of the Lord, the child was saved. So after the settlement of all disturbing conditions, and re-establishment of the peaceful order of the state and after seeing the surviving child Parikshit well satisfied, Mahara Yudhishthira felt some relief as a human being, although he had very little attraction for material happiness, which is always illusory and temporary. So here is the <clears throat> description of uh, Maharaj Yudhishthira ruling the whole world from Hastinapura and Vidura has arrived in the palace of Yudhishthira. He has been well received. Vidura's real purpose of coming to the palace was to deliver his elder brother Dhritarashtra but Yudhishthira received Vidura very nicely and uh, now we will see how Vidura will instruct Dhritarashtra in the presence of Yudhishthira. So it is being described that uh, Yudhishthira was ruling very nicely with the cooperation of his younger brothers who were all very competent administrators for the common people. So, Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport, Maharaj Yudhishthira and Arjuna were unhappy from the beginning of the battle of Kurukshetra. Both Yudhishthira and Arjuna, why just Yudhishthira and Arjuna? All the five Pandava brothers were pure devotees of Krishna. So such uh, pure devotees have no material desires at all. They simply want to render devotional service to Krishna in any situation, in any condition. So they are the ideal devotees. But even while executing their duties, they are always very, very conscious about the different uh, situations they might face while doing their duties. 
that they do not want to even unknowingly do any injustice to others or cause any problem for others cause any distress to others so it is described particularly with reference to yudhishthira and arjuna they were unhappy to fight this battle of kurukshetra so in the bhagavad gita we can see how arjuna was not willing to fight at the beginning of the battle so here i'll just read from the bhagavad gita the description that is there in the first chapter when arjuna wanted to see against whom he has to fight he requested krishna please take my chariot between the two armies and when krishna took the chariot between the two armies and stopped at a certain place arjuna could see within the midst of the armies of both parties his fathers grandfathers teachers maternal uncles brothers sons grandsons friends and also his father in law and well wishers all present there now in the bhagavad gita the description is given when the son of kunti arjuna saw all these different grades of friends and relatives he became overwhelmed with compassion and spoke thus now this arjuna becoming overwhelmed with compassion on seeing the different relatives grades of relatives from one perspective it can be said that he was overwhelmed with compassion for them uh, temporarily being uh, put into the bodily conception but from another perspective it is understood that because arjuna is a pure devotee of krishna he is very very kind and soft hearted person not only towards uh, the uh, people from his side but even for the enemies so this characteristic of uh, arjuna has been explained by shrila prabhupad in the bhagavad gita that arjuna's feeling compassion even for his enemy is due to his soft heartedness because he is a pure devotee of krishna in the shrimad bhagavatam it is explained that a pure devotee of krishna is actually uh, qualified with all good qualities यस्यास्ति भक्ति भगवती अकिंचन सर्वैर्गुणैस्तत्र समासते सुराह ओनली अ डिवोटी कैन बी हैविंग ऑल द गुड क्वालिटीज दैट आर टू बी फाउंड इन द देवतास इन द डेमीगॉड्स अदर्स मे हैव सम गुड क्वालिटीज but only a pure devotee of krishna uh, can have all the good qualities this is because only a pure devotee of krishna is sent person pure in the heart pure means such a devotee is completely free from any tinge of even material desires even the devatas in the heavenly planets they are very very pious so uh, because they are pious they have some 
good qualities. They have mostly got good qualities. But they are not free from material desires. Because they have a desire to enjoy in a pious way, they are not free from material desires for enjoyment in this world. That is the reason they actually occupy uh, such posts as rulers or administrators or controllers of various uh, um, facilities that is to be provided um, by Krishna's arrangement. Whereas a pure devotee like Arjuna or Yudhishthira they have absolutely no material desire for enjoyment of any kind. Therefore, when this situation was seen by Arjuna that I have to kill uh, my own kinsman, he began to reconsider, should I really fight in this battle? For what purpose? Am I uh, fighting this battle? So he began to consider. That's why uh, it is described that uh, what was Arjuna's reaction on seeing the uh, enemy? Arjuna told Krishna, My dear Krishna, seeing my friends and relatives present before me in such a fighting spirit, I feel the limbs of my body quivering and my mouth drying up. Now all these symptoms in Arjuna are due to his uh, soft-heartedness resulting from his being a pure devotee. My whole body is trembling and my hair is standing on end. My bow Gandiva is slipping from my hand and my skin is burning. I am now unable to stand here any longer. I am forgetting myself and my mind is reeling. I foresee only evil in fighting this battle. I do not see how any good can come from killing my own kinsmen in this battle. Nor can I desire any subsequent victory, kingdom or happiness. See, Arjuna's reasoning now <clears throat> very clearly indicates he is completely detached from any material enjoyment. He says that uh, <clears throat> what use are these kingdom, happiness or even life itself when our own kinsmen are standing in this battlefield ready to fight why should I kill them uh, for what purpose Arjuna says I am not prepared to fight with them even in exchange for the three worlds let alone this earth and you see how Arjuna is considering Sin will overcome us if we slay such aggressors. He is using the word aggressor for the uh, opposite party. Hmm? Aggressors means they have unlawfully actually uh, occupied the kingdom which rightfully belongs to the Pandavas. They have uh, uh, done so much injustice to the Pandavas. So such aggressors, according to the laws of uh, dharma, even if uh, one kills such aggressors, uh, there is no sin. In self-defense, uh, one kills an aggressor, there is no sin. But Arjuna, as a pure devotee, he is very, very careful to avoid all kinds of sinful activities. So he is considering whether there will be any sin involved in killing such aggressors. So he is 
thinking if there is sin involved in killing even the aggressors he thinks uh, why should i actually kill these people simply for the sake of a kingdom i'm not interested in a kingdom and he also points out although these men overtaken by greed see no fault in killing one's own family or quarreling with friends why should we with knowledge of the sin engage in these acts now we should remember that before arjuna came to fight this battle all efforts were made for uh, avoiding this battle by doing some peace negotiations so when all peace negotiations have failed after that they have come uh, to fight this battle the pandavas especially so uh, there is no sin involved in fighting this battle because it's a dharma yuddha hmm? that will be explained later in the bhagavad gita that this uh, battle is actually the will of the supreme lord krishna because krishna had incarnated to reduce the burden of this earth which was overburdened by the unnecessary defense forces of demoniac kings so when mother earth actually felt too much overburdened by these uh, demonia kings then uh, she went to brahma and brahma could not remedy the situation so all the devatas headed by brahma went to lord vishnu and uh, prayed to vishnu that you have to do something to reduce this burden of the demonia kings uh, so in response to their prayers lord vishnu i showed the devatas that the supreme lord will appear to reduce this uh, burden of the earth so krishna had appeared to reduce the burden of the earth therefore it was krishna's plan that all these demoniac kings be assembled in the battlefield of kurukshetra and uh, the pandavas will be krishna's instruments in uh, killing all these uh, demoniac kings and their uh, supporters and their followers and all demoniac nature people so krishna's plan was to um, reduce the burden on the earth by organizing or arranging this battle of kurukshetra so they, uh, because of the will of the supreme lord krishna in spite of the genuine efforts of yudhishthira the battle could not be avoided now arjuna will understand after krishna explains through the uh, instruction of the bhagavad gita that it is krishna's will that this battle be fought krishna directly says that and he also de- displays or demonstrates when he shows the universal form that actually i have killed all these people you just be my instrument and uh, engage in this fighting so arjuna understood that it is krishna's will and therefore arjuna actually fought the battle now even yudhishthira he was also uh, not willing to fight the battle so he made all attempts to uh, avoid this battle but then it could not be avoided then he fought the battle but after the battle was over yudhishthira was overwhelmed by the massacre that happened as a result of this battle so that is also described in an earlier portion in the in this first canto of the bhagavatam i'll just read that portion Yudhishthira overwhelmed by the death of his friends was a grief just like a common materialistic man uh, he began to speak oh my lot i am the most sinful man just see my heart which is full of ignorance 
This body which is ultimately meant for others has killed many many phalanxes of men. Again Yudhishthira like Arjuna is considering himself as having committed greatly uh, sinful activity by he thinks unnecessarily killing so many innocent people. Yudhishthira is uh, thinking I have killed many boys, brahmanas, well-wishers, friends, parents, preceptors and brothers. Though I live millions of years, I will not be relieved from the hell that awaits me for all these sins. Then how Yudhishthira is thinking as a very, very conscientious uh, devotee of the Lord. Yudhishthira is thinking. There is no sin for a king who kills for the right cause, who is engaged in maintaining his citizens. But this injunction is not applicable to me. I have killed many friends of women and I have caused enmity to such an extent that it is not possible to undo it by material welfare work. Again, Yudhishthira is also a pure devotee. So he is very, very careful not to uh, do any sin by which unnecessarily somebody else will be harmed or somebody else will be affected. As it is not possible, he is uh, reasoning now, as it is not possible to filter muddy water through mud or purify a wine-stained pot with wine, it is not possible to counteract the killing of men by sacrificing animals. Now it is said in the scriptures that by uh, performing Ashwamedha Yajna, even if one has performed the most sinful act of Brahmahatya, killing a Brahmana, among all types of killing, Brahmahatya is the most sinful act of killing. So uh, even Brahmahatya can be uh, nullified, the sin of Brahmahatya can be nullified by performing Ashwamedha Yajna. So Krishna arranged that Yudhishthira Maharaj perform three Ashwamedha Yajnas. So Yudhishthira is thinking that even though it is said that Ashwamedha Yajna can counteract the sin of killing even a Brahmana, still he is thinking it is not applicable to me. So uh, he was... Uh, Lamenting like this, when he went to the field, battlefield, after the uh, battle was over and uh, all the rituals were performed for um, cremating the, the relatives and the, and the, and the, and the uh, others who were supposed to be cremated. After that, Yudhishthira is thinking that what use... Uh, is fighting such a battle when so many uh, millions had to die. Actually, the Mahabharata describes there were 64 crore people who were killed in that battle of Kurukshetra. So it was a very, very big world war. So he was thinking just to enthrone me as the king, such a big massacre had to happen. Uh, so he is uh, uh, thinking that it was not justified. This battle was not justified. But later on, <clears throat> he was actually instructed by Krishna, instructed by all the great sages headed by Vyasa, and finally instructed by Bhishma also, that his fighting the battle was not um, wrong. It was actually the supreme will of the Supreme Lord Krishna. That was the uh, reason why this battle was fought. So there was no sin on part of either Arjuna or Yudhishthira in having fought the battle. But as it is said here uh, by Srila Prabhupada in the purport, after the battle Maharaj Yudhishthira was unhappy over such mass killings. Now, one more problem that Yudhishthira had at the end of the battle was that 
there was no one to continue the kuru dynasty after the pandavas because all the uh, surviving uh, descendants on the side of the kauravas and the pandavas were all killed in the battle except for uh, one surviving grandson of arjuna arjuna's son ashwatthama was killed uh, in the battle but ashwatthama's uh, sorry arjuna's son uh, abhimanyu was killed in the battle but abhimanyu's son uh, who was still in the womb of his uh, abhimanyu's wife uh, uttara arjuna's daughter in law so that child in the womb was the only surviving descendant of the entire kuru dynasty now that child also in the womb was attacked by ashwatthama at the end of the battle ashwatthama released a brahmastra uh, to kill that uh, child sir only surviving descendant of the entire kuru dynasty so that is being described in an earlier portion of the bhagavatam i'll read that portion uh, uttara when krishna was leaving after having enthroned yudhishthira krishna was leaving for dwaraka after uh, the prayers were offered by kunti and all the the um, devotees of krishna came to see him off that time uttara also approach krishna o lord of the universe my dear krishna you are the greatest of all mystics please protect me for there is no one else who can save me from the clutches of death in this world of duality oh my lord you are all powerful a fiery iron arrow is coming towards me fast my lord let it burn me personally if you so desire but please do not let it burn and abort my embryo please do me this favor see uttara who could make out that uh, this uh, uh, brahmastra was coming to actually abort the child in her womb her son so um, it is being described having patiently heard her words lord shri krishna was always very affectionate to his devotees could at once understand that ashwatthama the son of dronacharya had thrown the brahmastra to finish the last life in the pandava family krishna knew that this brahmastra was released by ashwatthama simply to kill the last surviving descendant of the entire kuru dynasty so seeing this glaring brahmastra proceeding towards them the pandavas took up their five respective weapons but since krishna was requested by uttara shri krishna having observed that a great danger was befalling his unalloyed devotees he at once took up a sudarshana disk to protect them then what did krishna do krishna resides in everyone's heart as parmatma so as such just to protect the progeny of the kuru dynasty he covered the embryo of uttara by his personal energy so he entered personally to protect the child in the mother's womb Uh, the only surviving descendant so it is described that even the last surviving or only surviving descendant of the pandavas was attacked by ashwatthama but by the grace of the supreme lord this child was saved so it is described that uh, yudhishthira after the settlement of all disturbing conditions and reestablishment of the peaceful order of the state and after seeing the surviving child parichit well satisfied maharaj yudhishthira felt some relief as a human being that means yudhishthira playing the part of a king he had his duty to rule the kingdom and in addition to ruling the kingdom he also had to select a train up and uh, uh, select a successor so that 
the world will be ruled by a proper king to protect the citizens. So the only surviving descendant, Parikshit, uh, Yudhishthira was very careful to uh, raise him properly and and also um, train him up to become the successor emperor. So when uh, everything was well uh, settled, he felt some relief as a human being means as a playing the part of a king, he felt some relief that yes, uh, the <clears throat> kingdom is well administered by the support of his younger brothers who are expert administrators. And Parikshit is being trained as a successor. So in that way he felt some relief. Though he was completely mortified after uh, uh, considering the huge massacre that happened at the end of the Battle of Kurukshetra. But it is the last sentence in the purport Prabhupada says, Yudhishthira, even though he felt some relief as a human being, but he had very little attraction for material happiness, which is always illusory and temporary. This is the uh, perspective of a pure devotee. A pure devotee knows what is the value of material happiness. Material happiness is not at all real happiness. This is uh, something which is very difficult to understand for the common people because they are completely under the spell of illusion in this world. Material happiness is illusory because it is simply a sensation when the sense objects come in contact with the senses. This is explained by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Yehi samsparshaja bhoga dukkha yonaya evate adyantavanta kaunteya nateshu ramate budaha. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that uh, this uh, samsparshaja bhoga, some uh, so-called feeling of happiness, material happiness, bhoga, material pleasure, that is generated, samsparshaja, ja means that which is born of or generated, by what samsparsha, by contact, contact of what? It is always contact of the senses and the sense object. Just like the pleasure we feel, we know, we have experience. When we eat something very palatable, we very well know that the happiness or the actually it is material pleasure, uh, sense pleasure, uh, pleasure of a sensation that is due to the contact. Because after having placed, let's say, some nice eatable on the tongue, the momentary pleasure that we feel lasts only a few moments, that's all. You cannot keep on uh, relishing that uh, for a long time. Now, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, all uh, pleasures of the senses coming in contact with the sense objects are like that. They are all momentary. Because it is simply a sensation. It is simply a sensation. It is not actually any uh, real happiness. Real happiness is completely different. What is the difference between this kind of uh, material pleasure, a momentary pleasure, and um, uh, real happiness? Real happiness is something which is to be experienced by our spiritual senses. 
because we are spirit soul we are not this body so the body is made up of some material senses and we as spirit soul we have our original spiritual senses when we experience some material pleasure the spiritual senses at the present moment are covered so we do not really have any experience of spiritual happiness hmm? so how is this uh, pleasure being um experienced it is actually a sensation in the mind therefore krishna explains in the second chapter of the bhagavad gita uh, that all types of happiness and distress which we experience materially are actually mental concoctions uh, the um sensation of the contact sense contact sensation is in the mind and this mind is simply giving a a false um feeling of so called happiness or distress because everything is happening in the mind as spirit soul the person who is experiencing through the mind or through the senses actually is uh, simply imagining oh very nice or not so pleasurable it is painful so this pleasure and pain sensations the feelings of happiness and distress all these are in the mind and we have very uh, good experience that all these are actually temporary no pain or pleasure lasts beyond a certain uh, amount of time so therefore Uh, krishna describes these uh, sensations samsparsha jab hoga as dukha yoni simply they are the cause of so many miseries because to secure such uh, uh, material pleasures we have to make elaborate arrangements it doesn't come uh, so easily at least for human beings it doesn't come so easily so much arrangements have to be made because this is something that is uh, actually a mental concoction the mind has to be in a proper uh, state to actually experience just like somebody in too much anxiety due to let's say having lot of work now can they actually in the middle of such anxiety due to uh, some work related um, stress can they really sit and eat peacefully and enjoy something palatable they cannot we know many times very very uh, busy businessmen they have no time to spend with their near and dear ones they have no time to properly even eat they have no time to properly enjoy a vacation so uh, the state of mind that is required uh, that is to be always properly prepared for any such uh, uh, material enjoyment and as regards material distress nobody wants it but it is forced upon us in fact it comes as a shock so much uh, uh, we are uh, making plans and uh, for enjoying and suddenly all such plans are interrupted by these sudden calamities or distresses or dangers that come which are forced upon us so that's the Uh, real nature of so called material happiness there's no real happiness 
सो कृष्ण से संद भगवत गीता न तेषु रमते बुधा द इंटेलिजेंट पर्सन नोस दैट दीज आर ऑल वेरी टेम्प्ररी एंड दीज आर नॉट रियल सोर्स ऑफ हैप्पीनेस सो दे द इंटेलिजेंट पर्सन डजेंट टेक सच प्लेजर्स वेरी सीरियसली नोस वॉट इज द वैल्यू ऑफ सच मेटीरियल प्लेजर्स सो elsewhere it is said in scriptures ramante yogino anante the yogis those who are transcendental spiritualists yogi means one who has established or one who is practicing yoga to establish one's real relationship with krishna so such a yogi in the perfection of yoga practice he relishes uh, ananta ramana unlimited pleasure unlimited happiness ramante yogino anante so uh, what is the nature of such happiness satyananda chidatmani it is based on uh, reality it's got the foundation of uh, spiritual reality it is not based on illusion such happiness which a yogi experiences or strives to uh, experience is not based on illusion all our endeavors for trying to squeeze out some pleasure out of material uh, sensations is based on the platform of illusion it's it's based on uh, the arrangement of the senses sense objects the state of mind all these but the yogis are completely detached from their senses from their mind from mental concoction and they are firmly established in their spiritual uh, position in their relationship with krishna so they experience real happiness on the spiritual platform satyananda and on the spiritual platform it is called ananda ananda means uh, spiritual happiness which is uh, everlasting it is not something which is a temporary sensation it is not dependent on some favorable sense contact it is independent of all these conditions it's unconditional unconditional happiness unlimited happiness so satyanande chidatmani it is something which is on the platform of uh, the soul on the platform of spiritual knowledge spiritual understanding uh um, therefore the yogis or the spiritualists they experience real happiness and such real happiness is available very easily through uh, the practice of bhakti yoga as taught by shri chaitanya mahaprabhu in any case spiritual happiness is only through bhakti yoga but even in the practice of bhakti there are different uh, uh, ways of uh, engaging in devotional service the bhagavatam says there are nine different ways shravanam kirtanam vishnu smaranam pada sevanam archanam vandanam dasyam satyam atmanivedana so among all these different methods of uh, doing devotional service the easiest is hearing and chanting that is the easiest and even among uh, the different uh, spiritual subject matter that one can hear and chant the easiest is hearing and chanting the holy name of krishna the hari krishna mantra so chaitanya mahaprabhu teaches us that particularly we should uh, focus on the process of hearing and chanting about krishna among all the different processes of devotional service 
and even among the different uh, subject matters for hearing and chanting about Krishna, he particularly singles out the hearing and chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra based on the, the instruction given in the Upanishads, the Kali Santana Upanishad. Hare um, uh, iti shodashakam nam nam kali kalmashanashanam nata paratro paya sarva vedeshu drushyate. In a conversation between Narada and Brahma, uh, Narada is inquiring in Kali Yuga, what is the best means to overcome the evil influence of this Kali Yuga? So Brahma says the best method is simply to hear and chant the Hare Krishna mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Iti Shodashakam Nam Nam. The 16 names of the Supreme Lord, Hari, uh, arranged in this way, in the form of the Hare Krishna mantra. Kalikal Mashanashanam. It completely destroys the evil effect of Kali Yuga. Because Narada's specific question was, in this Kali Yuga, how can people surmount the evil influence of Kali? So, Brahma's reply is specifically for surmounting, overcoming the influence of the evil influence of Kali Yuga. So, Kali Kalma Shanashana. And further, Brahma reassures Narada that there is no better method. If you search through the entire Vedic literature, you can't find a better method. Nata Parataropaya Sarva Vede Shudrushyate. You see? So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu singles out this particular um, instruction from the Upanishad, from the Kali Santarana Upanishad, and instructs us that simply uh, chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Simply by uh, chanting this Hare Krishna mantra, one can very easily overcome the evil influence of Kali Yuga and experience the highest. Uh, happiness, ramante yogino anante, that which the yogis are meant to, the spiritualists or transcendentalists are meant to experience, the unlimited, unconditional uh, happiness on the spiritual platform. Now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu points out that when we chant Hare Krishna, our consciousness is elevated to the spiritual platform because Krishna is fully present. Uh, in his uh, uh, name. Nam nam akari bahuda nija sarva shakti hi. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu points out in a Shikshashtaka that uh, the Lord is uh, present in his names and is invested all his spiritual potencies in his name. So, therefore, uh, we come directly in contact with Krishna with all his spiritual potencies when we chant hear and chant the Hare Krishna mantra. So therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu particularly stresses this chanting of Hare Krishna to uh, very easily uplift our consciousness simply by this chanting. Otherwise, the normal method of uplifting our consciousness, which is uh, completely immersed in uh, material illusion, so many different methods are there recommended in the scriptures even in the process of bhakti if somebody tries to uh, purify their consciousness or uplift their consciousness from the material uh, illusion then in the process of archana one has to actually uh, do elaborate uh, deity worship hmm? very very uh, 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 complicated it's not so simple hmm? or uh, one has to uh, uh, offer prayers to the Lord. Uh, so many different methods are there, uh, but all of them are uh, not so uh, easy to perform, for the, especially for the common people in Kali Yuga. Whereas this chanting, hearing and chanting, the Hare Krishna mantra, anybody can do it. And simply by vibrating the tongue and hearing, the sound of this Hare Krishna mantra, 
one can actually immediately uplift oneself to the spiritual platform. And on the spiritual platform, it is possible to experience the transcendental or the spiritual or the um, unlimited, unconditional happiness that we are hankering for. We are hankering for that happiness which is unlimited and unconditional. But what we get through this material uh, uh, sense uh, experiences, sense pleasures, that is uh, neither it is uh, um, unlimited nor is it uh, unconditional nor is it any real happiness at all. Even for the brief moment it is not even real happiness. It is simply a mental concoction. So it never really satisfies the soul. So in the Bhagavatam it is explained in several places. What can satisfy the soul? Uh, the soul can be satisfied only by bhakti, by devotional service. And even in devotional service, the easiest way to actually uh, experience uh, the spiritual happiness, satisfaction of the soul, is uh, by chanting, hearing and chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra. So I'll stop here. Nantara Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jaya Shri Prabhupada Ki Jaya. Hare Krishna, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss any updates.